Let me start with this story from about 20 years ago. In 1999, right as we were moving into the new century, the new millennium, and I was invited to a conference where people were discussing some of the greatest accomplishments of the past thousand years and making predictions about the next thousand years. And I was on a panel where they asked us the following question. What was the most important invention of the past thousand years? And people had lots of different ideas. One of the panelists suggested the printing press. Someone else talked about the steam engine. Another person selected the computer. And of course, all of those are incredibly important inventions, and each has transformed society in its own way. But as I thought about the most important invention of the last thousand years, I had a different suggestion. Kindergarten. Now, some people might be surprised by that, because probably to a lot of people, they don't even think of kindergarten as an invention, let alone an important invention. But kindergarten was an invention. When Friedrich Froebel invented the first kindergarten in 1837, he wasn't just creating a school for younger kids. He was inventing a radically new approach to education, fundamentally different from schools that had come before. And although Froebel certainly couldn't have known it, his approach to education was ideally suited to the needs of today's 21st century society, not just for five-year-olds, but for all of us, for learners of all ages. So what makes Froebel's kindergarten so special? Well, before Froebel, most schools were based on what might be called a broadcast approach to education. A teacher stood in the front and broadcast information and instruction to students. And Froebel knew that wasn't going to work with five-year-olds, so he shifted to a much more interactive approach to education. He designed and developed a set of toys and materials that became known as Froebel's gifts that children could use to learn and play and interact with. With Froebel's uh, geometric tiles, Kids can make mosaic patterns. With his blocks, they can make towers and buildings. With his sticks and peas, they could assemble three-dimensional three structures. And if you walk into a kindergarten today, you can see descendants of Froebel's gifts and Froebel's ideas. Children are often playfully collaborating with one another on creative activities. You know, and in the process, kids are learning important ideas and concepts. When children are building castles and houses with wooden blocks, they learn about structures and stability. When they make paintings with finger paint, they learn how colors mix together. But, but more important than that, and much more important in my mind, kids are learning about the creative process. They're learning how to start with an, the inkling of an idea and turn it into a project. How to imagine an idea, test it out, share it with others, and continually refine the idea based on their experiences. And these creative thinking skills that kids learn in kindergarten are ideally suited for the needs of today's fast-changing society. I think that we can all agree that the world is changing more quickly now than ever before, that today's children, as they grow up, are going to be confronted with a never-ending stream of unexpected situations uh, and unknown challenges. So the ability to think and act creatively is going to be more important than ever before, and that's precisely what kids are learning in kindergarten. But there's a problem, that when kids leave kindergarten and move on to elementary school and middle school and beyond, oftentimes things change. They spend a lot of time sitting in desks, filling out worksheets, listening to lectures, it's often going back to the broadcast approach, where a teacher is delivering information or delivering instruction, or a computer is delivering instruction or delivering information. And this approach is not well aligned with the needs of today's society. It doesn't help kids develop as creative thinkers. And even worse, many of today's kindergartens are starting to move into this type of approach. If you go into kindergartens today, Oftentimes, you will start to see kids filling out math worksheets or drilling on phonics flashcards 
with less time for creative play and exploration. So in short, today's kindergartens are starting to become more like the rest of school. And what we need is exactly the opposite. We need to make the rest of school, in fact, the rest of life, more like kindergarten. That's the goal of my research group at the MIT Media Lab. And that's why we call it the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. We're trying to spread the spirit of kindergarten to learners of all ages, from all backgrounds, to provide opportunities for everyone, everyone, to continue to experiment and explore and express themselves so they can develop the creative capacities that are needed to thrive in today's society. Uh, you know, let me give an example of, of, of the type of way we go about that. You know, we tend to think about the kindergarten approach in terms of four guiding principles that we call the four P's of creative learning. Projects, passion, peers, and play. That is, we develop technologies and activities to engage kids in working on projects based on their passions, in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit. And we think that's the way to sustain that kindergarten spirit of learning. For example, we've worked for many years with the Lego toy company on developing a new generation of building blocks with electronics inside so that kids could build not just structures like houses and castles, but buildings that move and sense and communicate and interact. You might think of these as the foible gifts of the 21st century, but they used technologies that were certainly unavailable and unimaginable in Froebel's era, but they're based on the spirit of Froebel's kindergarten, providing kids with opportunities to experiment and explore and express themselves and develop as creative thinkers. As we started developing the first versions of these programmable Lego bricks, we tried them out with a group of 10 to 13-year-old girls, and we encouraged them to use these new technologies to invent something that could be useful to them in their everyday life. At the end of the workshop, a local TV crew, TV crew came, and they made this video highlighting some of the girls' inventions. Yeah, see? It just beeps. Christina Costa is trying to build a better mouse trap. Make that gerbil trap. Every time they want to go inside this gerbil house, they press this light sensor. It's one of the many inventions created at this free math and science camp run by the Computer Museum and the Girl Scouts, where girls from Boston are devising everything from an odometer for roller blades to a diary security system. When someone touches this to try to open the diary, it'll take a picture of that person. So like if your creepy little brother tries to read your diary? Yeah. He's on camera. Yes. <laughs> I think even in this short video, you can get a sense of the four Ps in practice. That first girl was working on a project based on her passion. She wasn't just building a house for any gerbil. She was building a house for her gerbil, so she really cared about it. She wanted to make an automatic door so the gerbil could go in and out easily. And she started collecting data each time the door opened and shut because she was really interested in what was her pet gerbil doing during the day while she was at school. Or what was it doing at night while she was sleeping? Or the second girl loved rollerblading. So she wanted to know how fast was she going on her rollerblades. So she attached a little magnetic sensor to the wheel of the rollerblade to count the rotations. But she wanted to know how fast she was going in miles per hour. So she had to figure out how to convert rotations per second into miles per hour. And in school, there had been lessons about that type of unit conversion but she hadn't paid attention because she figured, what's the purpose? But now she had a reason for it. So since she was so engaged, so passionate, she was able to learn the mathematical ideas to make that conversion. You know, I think in these cases, we can see that even though these girls certainly were above kindergarten age, they were still learning in the kindergarten spirit, working on projects based on their passions and collaboration with peers in a playful spirit and developing as creative thinkers. You now, these examples, they were building things in the physical world. We know that today, kids spend a lot of time in online worlds and virtual worlds, and we want to make sure that kids still have opportunities for kindergarten-style learning in the online world. And that's what led us 
to develop the Scratch programming language and online community. With Scratch, kids don't just play games, they create and share games. They don't just watch animations online, they create and share animations. If you go to the Scratch website, you can see millions and millions of interactive stories and games and animations created by kids around the world. Right now, there's more than 20 million registered members of the Scratch online community. Let me tell you about one of them, whose username is Ipsy. And from an early age, Ipsy loved to draw. Every day, she would fill sketchbooks you know, with drawings and sketches. Uh, and one day, a friend told Ipsy about Scratch and explained that Ipsy could use Scratch to make their drawings come alive. And Ipsy was intrigued and tried it out. This is one of Ipsy's first projects. So Ipsy started with, you know, with something familiar, drawing, drew a picture, but then used Scratch and wrote programs to animate the eyes and the ears. And this is a good learning strategy. Start with something you're passionate about, in this case, drawing, and then learn something new, in this case, coding. And Ipsy really enjoyed making their drawings come alive. So decided to keep working on Scratch uh, and worked on more and more sophisticated projects over time. Here's a project that Ipsy made called Lemonade Time. It was a game, and to play this game, you use the arrow keys to move around the otter to gather ingredients like lemons and water and sugar for making lemonade, getting advice from the bird and other characters. After Ipsy made the project, Ipsy shared the project with peers in the online community. And this is the project page, and you can see that the project was viewed by you know, more than 17,000 people and loved by close to 2,000 people. It was remixed 88 times, means that someone else took Ipsy's project and modified the programming scripts or the graphics to make their own project. And more than 1,700 people gave comments giving encouragement or feedback or suggestions to Ipsy. And Ipsy was clearly paying attention. If you look at the instructions, you can see that Ipsy added some notes saying that due to popular demand, that the otter now walks a little bit faster. <laughs> some people also you know, really liked Ipsy's artwork and asked to see more of it. So Ipsy started sharing projects like this one that were branded as Ipsy Studio where you could see more of Ipsy's work. Ipsy put down some rules saying that it's fine to you know, make use of the artwork, but you should give credit to Ipsy if you use the artwork. So the same way that kindergarten kids learn to share in the classroom, Ipsy was learning to share in the online community. Some kids in the online community get really upset when someone else makes use of their artwork. But Ipsy recognized that everyone benefits when everyone shares. So if we look at Ipsy's projects, we get a chance to see the four Ps in practice. Ipsy was working on projects based on passions in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit, and really continuing to learn in a kindergarten style and developing as a creative thinker. Let me end with the story of two kindergarten children. I heard the story from a friend of mine whose daughter, Lily, was in kindergarten. And Lily came home one day and told her mom about a conversation that she had had with Daisy, another kindergarten student. And evidently, Daisy had started kindergarten very early, so was spending a second year in kindergarten. And Lily explained it to her mom this way, saying that, you know, that Daisy did kindergarten last year and is doing it again this year for two whole years. I'm going to do kindergarten again, too. And when I heard this story, I was happy that, that Lily was really enjoying kindergarten. Uh, and clearly, uh, Lily recognized that kindergarten was a special time and a special place. But I think that Lily also you know, realized and seemed to be worried that after leaving kindergarten, that she wouldn't have more opportunities for creative play and creative expression. So I share Lily's concerns and I'm going to do something about it. I think it's really important that young children, like Lily and Daisy, as they continue to grow up, continue to have opportunities to learn in a kindergarten spirit, uh, to have opportunities to explore, experiment, and express themselves, 
to continue to develop as creative thinkers. So we need to find ways to extend the kindergarten approach to children of all ages, from all backgrounds. So I hope you'll join me in this effort, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a policymaker or just someone who really cares about kids. Let's all work together to make sure that children of all ages continue to have opportunities to work on projects based on their passion in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. There's nothing more important than helping today's young children grow up as creative thinkers so they can be full and active contributors in tomorrow's society. Thank you very much.